part of our Older Americans Month uh, series of programs. <laughs> so what day is. You don't have to rub it I know, yeah. and I know I'm going to get some heckling from the Americans audience here. on this, but one of our programming themes this year and last year is um, to age more. So to get the most out of life at whatever age you happen to be. So rather than worrying about turning 16 when you're 15 or worrying about being, you know, 100 when you're 99, whatever age you are, making sure that you make the most out of that time and that you can be active and this guy rode his bike in today, so that's uh, a tribute, but also... He lives down the street. He's <laughs> next <laughs> But the, um, this was a result of another program that we did a while back. Os Oscar Beasley uh, talked about his adventures riding bikes up until he's, he's still sending me pictures and photographs of his everyday biking, and he's over 90 years old now. So um, some of us are lucky physically <laughs> and can continue to do these things. And, um, but he, he stepped up and said, um, you know, I have, I have a story to tell. If, uh, if you don't mind, and I said, I would love that. So if any of you have stories about your own personal adventures that you'd be interested in sharing with the rest of the community here at the Senior Center, I highly encourage you to, to talk to me or someone from our program committee about doing that. And I just want to thank you for putting this presentation together, offering to present it, and coming here on such a beautiful day. I love talking about this because it was a running adventure, but also it was a travel adventure as well. And you know, losing one already. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank uh, some people in particular. Uh, uh, Sally and Nancy. Sally was my uh, work with me at Chairside Dental System. I'm a retired professor of dentistry and Sally for uh, twenty years, years <laughs> a long time. And Tom Shulon, who probably all of you know about Tom and the birds on in his presentations. He was a um, colleague and also re retired. And Fred, with whom I bicycle. Nice to have Fred. Did you bicycle down from Cedar Rapids? No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> and Omar, with whom I play bridge. So it's great to see friendly faces. <laughs> and the crown. And the crown. And the crown. Okay. Has anyone here? Run a marathon. Close. You run a marathon. Okay. Yeah. Good. I run the half marathon. Do any of you wish that you had run a marathon maybe when you were younger? No. I yeah. kind of. You kind of kind of wish that. I, yeah, no, you wish. I dropped out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Are any of you planning on running a marathon at some time in the future? I can put the water out for you. <laughs> I said, are you about that? Do it. I almost died because you just put water up. Well, actually, I am planning on trying a marathon after uh, after my 80th birthday, which is in just a little less than a year. And I'll, I, I'm still running, and I'll train, and I'll say, I'm not sure I can do it, but I think I can, otherwise I wouldn't try. So. And so I was telling somebody about it. They just read about they read about someone. They ran a marathon when they were 90. So whatever we do something. You just want to be around the world. <laughs> okay. And so the uh let's see the story. Okay. So there are uh, seven continents, and I'll tell you how all of this uh, came about because when I started running marathons I didn't even think I wasn't aware that there were there there is an organization that recognizes those who have run not all seven continents and and uh, done several I've done a total of 20 and most of those as you might have mentioned were in the United States and these were uh, some of those and, and this is the Des Moines Marathon which actually is a very very nice marathon it is uh, one of my uh, favorites and some others that work. <laughs> also uh, remarkable in many ways. This is my first and uh, in Chicago and this is my uh, brother-in-law and my brother-in-law had done uh, two 
Portland marathons, and if you said, well, if I could do it, you could do it. I got challenge from my brother-in-law, I couldn't pass that up. So we decided to do uh, Chicago, and so that was my first, and I was uh, 53 when I did my first marathon, so it's not just for the uh, younger a generation, as you'll learn, and I trained quite a bit, and that was my fastest a marathon. And Chicago was nice, but uh, I didn't think it was exceptional. You'll see there were some other marathons. It's, it's pretty three fine. hours and 31 minutes. Three, yeah, I ran three, three hours 31 minutes. That is my fastest marathon. I pushed hard, I trained hard. My goal was to qualify for Boston, which I did. And it, which actually was, uh, my qualifying time was three hours and 30 minutes, but it was a very slow start. I mentioned that on my application uh, to Boston, they accepted that. So I was indeed enrolled. Actually, I've done uh, Boston twice in 1993 and 1997. All of you know about the Boston Marathon. That is the granddaddy of all of them. And it's, it was so, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. It was, it was so exciting be there with all the best runners in the world that were competing and it's so exciting all the lead up to the marathon and they they put us to what they call corrals we're kind of caged in areas we had to be in that corral and they would release us at the time we were going to start running there were the helicopters overhead with the video cameras going i classified it as a medium a difficulty i had two different at uh, times, one was four hours and 16 minutes, and, and I ran it again. And I was quite a bit slower. And what happened in this, and I, I didn't know that much about training for a marathon, I didn't carbohydrate load enough, and I became carbohydrate depleted about halfway through the marathon. So I had a good first half. The second half, uh, I had to run and walk. I just couldn't, I couldn't keep it going, and I would. So I would run for a few blocks, and then I'd walk some, and I was kind of staggering. And actually, to come out and say, you should get off the course. No, I, I could go. And so I did finish it. And then ran it again a few years later. Uh, what also made this interesting was that uh, I ran this on my birthday, April 19th, which is also Patriot's Day. You know what Patri anybody know what Patriot's Day is? Tom Gurr is starting. You know, it's called Patriot's Day. Oh, that's it. That was a shot fired heard around the world. Uh, that was the opening of the Revolutionary War. So that's they run that on the Monday closest to uh, Patriot's Day. The and it was pretty exciting. That was also the day that the government forces attacked the Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. So that got all the news. You didn't think that. The, so they didn't put you in lights, huh? Yeah, we got super season. We didn't get as much publicity <laughs> as it was uh, due. <clears throat> My next one is a few months later, and uh, this is in New York. The New York Marathon was a wonderful marathon. I was just so excited. We ran all five boroughs. Started Staten Island, ran across the Arizona Narrows Bridge, which that's the most weight ever on the bridge. It's during the marathon. You can feel it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it hasn't fallen. And then into Brooklyn, and into Queens, and then back into, into Manhattan, up to the Bronx, out of the Bronx, back. This is in Central Park, so it's probably about a mile or two miles from the finish line. It was hot, and you can see that there were a lot of runners that were really, it looked like a war zone. Off to the side, there were people who were collapsed and, and gasping and couldn't finish, and an ambulance coming and giving, medics giving them fluids, and so forth. But I. I did finish. I, was, I finished every marathon. I've, I've never not finished any event that I've entered, whether it's bicycling or running or using triathlons. Talk about what your exercise was before, before you did a marathon. You were 53, so that yeah. you were obviously exercising. I've always well, been in pretty good shape. Uh -huh. I started running in my uh, early 30s and I've always done a lot of uh, I've done backpacking, hiking, and mountain climbing, and, and uh, all kinds of different things. So I'm aerobically and physically, I always enjoy a pretty good condition, and I try to maintain that still. Did you ever think you wanted to do under three? Ever think of what? 
that you want to get under three, you know, they always have under three hours. <laughs> well, I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, that's really, really hard to do. Well, that, some of these elite runners that are running in two hours and nine to ten minutes, that's unbelievable. That's that's amazing. They're all they're all heart and lungs and bone and muscle. Boys. So my two two of my Europe, I've actually done a third. I also did Stockholm later, on which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, in uh, London in 1995, the London Marathon, and then uh, also in Athens in uh, 1996. And London was oh, it was really a wonderful marathon. It was interesting. At the, when the day that I ran it. This was the largest marathon that ever had taken place for 27,000 uh, runners. It was a very slow start. It was, they had designed the route for a few thousand runners and kept growing, growing. They didn't change the route, so that we were going down some narrow streets and and it was crowded, very crowded for the first 22 miles. Had to, had somebody elbow in front and behind. I was tripped a couple of times. And uh, I'm sure by, by accident. But when we lined up, we were so far from the starting line, we could hear way off the distance. Bang! The starting gun went off. And we <laughs> Gradually, you see if it had to start moving. So it was several minutes before you could it's get supposed to be started. one of the flattest thing, I understand. Is that right? Pardon? It's supposed to be one of the flattest in the world. Oh, yeah. A couple like that. Yeah, oh yeah. And we went, we ran by a lot of uh, notable sites, and I'm sure that most of you have been to London and have seen a lot of these. <clears throat> so at the finish line, I, I liked, I always tried to be under four hours. That was in the early years, I didn't do that in the later years. And I was, but I couldn't really get my pace into really until 22 miles. You just had to run. With the crowd, so I didn't quite make uh, 22 or 22. I didn't quite make uh, the four hours, but I was fairly close. And the, uh, a friend photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> so he, you should call this the Pamplona. <laughs> okay, Athens. This was overall sort of one of the most unique. And this was the Athens, it was the 100th anniversary of the first modern marathon, which was 1896. And we ran the route, if you know the story, of Pheidippides, who ran from the village of Marathon back to the Athens to announce that the, uh, that the Athenians had defeated the Persians on the plains of Marathon. And supposedly he ran so fast that he died. He died as a true. We didn't, I don't think anyone died. There were 1,700 runners. It was a very difficult. It was a long, long hill going up to the there's Athens kind of sits in a bowl. I'm sure many of you have been to Athens, and uh, so it was very slow. And and, and uh, uh, we're going up that hill, and it was a hot day. And, and we had heard that there was a water shortage, that they didn't put out enough water. Uh, it was. It was the marathon was done Greek style. It was organized Greek style, which means you were disorganized. <laughs> and there wasn't enough of those kinds of things to help support the runners. And uh, I had, so I was told, I'd get some water and hide it along the route as you were traveling out there. Because it was, we went out on buses, I could take a cab. Out. And so I stopped and I had some water and I had some orange juice. We're running, I couldn't find the water. I don't know if somebody else found it or whatever. All I found was the orange juice. I drank a liter of orange juice. And after the end of the marathon, I threw up orange juice. I still don't like orange juice <laughs> <laughs> to this day. And uh, but there were some that would. There were some bottles. Some people pulled hoses out of their lawn, and so I I did get enough hydration, but some were not. And occasionally they. Maybe you see these, they have bins of water with sponges. And you can put the sponge in, you can wipe yourself down, put the sponge back in the water. I saw some drinking <laughs> out, of those, uh, out of those bins. 
So, as I said, that was in Athens, and we, Laura and I, Laura did most of these, well, she did all the continents with me, and most of the other marathons, too. We did the, the tourist things as well, and the bib, which is, is on cloth. It's kind of interesting. So this is in the village of Marathon, and we dropped off there. Nobody could find the starting line. There were people wandering around the village, whereas we were here, bang! Somewhere, so we all started running. We knew the road that led out of there, only one road in the town, so we followed that. This was a group of uh, Puerto Ricans that uh, ran with us. So, this is the finish, and that's in the 1896 Olympic Stadium. And in the 1996, the marathon or the uh, Olympics were in, in Athens, and that stadium is still there. It's a marble, it's a beautiful stadium. So, we finished. Uh, in the uh, stadium, and so, uh, right, but the interesting thing in this picture, this, this fellow, he's a, they're juggling marathoners, and they compete, and they, so they juggle the entire 26 miles. If, if they drop a ball, they're disqualified oh, no. from, from being a juggling. So, and I talked, he's from Germany, and I talked to him yes. after the, uh, after the marathon, and he said he did not drop a ball, but he, and he was hoping to set the world's record. And he, but it was it was very hot. And Rick, should we of course, they could stop and and put the balls, jump the balls down, and get drink some water. And so should we hold questions till the end? Yeah, yeah, that would be better okay. if you hold the questions till the end. Right. And if you can see, I have on my uh, I wore this. In fact, you showed that for me. Yeah, bro. You yeah, that so. Iowa. <laughs> On the oh, I did. on my yeah, I did. You did that, right? Wow. I lost it. You lost it. I then. lost it. Yeah. Oh, I lose sure. it. Are you, are you, you, are you sure lose that's you? Anything? Are you sure that's you? Are you there? I mean, that guy's got muscles. <laughs> 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 that's so that was a certificate. It was interesting because in the. Uh, Right near the finish line, this fellow was sitting there on the car table, he had all the stack of these certificates, and so I told him he could go over there and he'll get it, he'll sign the certificate. He was the mayor, he said he was the mayor of Athens, and he, he said, well, what is your, you can tell him any time that you wished, I could have given him, I could have given him a world record, I guess. <laughs> But I gave him my honest time. I ran at 3:52, so I considered that a good, uh, good time, considering the difficulty of the uh, conditions. And uh, at the finish line, and then there, this uh, statue, and this is the Spartans, as you probably know, the, they originated the Olympics going back BC, and they did, they ran, did everything naked. So went over here. And uh, I was going to drop my shorts, but Laura wouldn't take my picture, so I I noticed that they didn't ever show the statue from this side. You can see it from the back during the uh, 1996 Olympics. And then we went with the group for most of the uh, the marathons in other continents with called Marathon Tours out of Boston. And they go to a few select marathons around the world, and it's, it's a tour group. And they arrange all the things for the marathon, but they also have some travel, some additional things. We went out to the Greek islands, uh, in Mykonos for a few days. And they, and they are beautiful. But it was cold, and we heard there was a nude beach. <laughs> <laughs> so I rented this motor scooter, and Laura and I went up to the beach. And it was so cold, no, no, no. we were the only one, nobody was naked, but nobody else was on the beach. <laughs> the next marathon was uh, Oceania, and Oceania is the seven, one of the seven continents, and that's Australia, New Zealand, and the South Pacific Islands. And uh, what was unique about this marathon is it was the Millennium Marathon, so uh, that New Zealand is in the very first time zone. So 
the new millennium started in New Zealand, so we were there uh, to do this marathon. We took off early in the morning, so we were the first marathon of the, uh, the 2000 millennium. And this was in uh, Hamilton, which is just uh, south of Auckland, a bit of New Zealand, a bit of New Zealand. It's a wonderful, wonderful country. And then after the uh, marathon, then we flew south to uh, Queenstown, and then we did a trek, and I'll show you a picture from that. So that was our the additional adventure. So the Millennium Marathon, so it was the first marathon, the new millennium, we took off at dawn, it was in a drizzle, light rain, and then it got warm, and so it was hot and steamy. And uh, I don't remember, the route was not particularly interesting, but a lot of places there were ladies out in their driveways, we ran by with, would you like a spot of tea or a bit of coffee? <laughs> and which was very nice. <laughs> That's what I remember. I got lost. And so not a very interesting course. And there at the finish line, and Laura ran the, uh, she did the uh, 5K, and then she did some of the other runs as well. That's a good time. Oh yeah, the 5K. Yeah, yeah, that was a good, that was a good time. And Laura's not, she doesn't run any longer. She never did like running very much. And so it's pretty boring. <laughs> well, it can be. And this is the, you may have heard of the Milford track. This is the Rootburn track. Did you hear that, Fred? I've heard of the Milford track. The Milford, yeah, this is the, kind of the alternative, the Rootburn. This is the group that did the uh, track. And uh, these, uh, Mick and Jeannie Ramsey from Glen Allen, Illinois, they were there. This is all of their family. Their uh, three children and spouses. And uh, so the whole family went there to run the uh, marathon. And, and uh, we got to know uh, Mick and Jeannie, and uh, they did all the rest of the uh, continents with us. And so you'll see them in the other, other pictures. And uh, wonderful people and still good friends. Okay, so next was Antarctica. And so that's obviously has to be part of running the uh, seven continents. And this was on St. George Island, which is the Antarctic Peninsula here in South America. Have any of you been to Antarctica? Sorry. You really have to want to go to Antarctica. <laughs> the only way you can do it is on a ship. And the, head, and the ship has to cross the uh, Great Passage which these had the reputation, those are the roughest seas in the world. So it's an interesting voyage. We were, we were on the ship for uh, several days. So here is the location, uh, King George Island, where we're to run the marathon. And from Ushuaia, the most southern cities in the world, and across the Great uh, Package Passage and called the last marathon, appropriately. And, and I, oh, I forgot to mention this. When we, uh, when we finished the uh, Millennium Marathon in New Zealand, we, they had a post-race dinner for, actually for all the runners. But Marathon Tours then gave out a couple of certificates of the, uh, the Seven Continents Club. And that's where we learned about the Seven Continents Club. That, Everyone who runs each of the continents that is joins the Seven Continents Club. And there were very few at that time, there were 40 in the world. And they know for sure that these are the only ones that done all seven continents because it only marathon tours goes to Antarctica. So that's how you can keep that, keep that knowledge base. So it was 11 days at sea, we did shore landings. We had a lot of lectures, a lot of our group were seasick. Some couldn't run, they were seasick the whole 11 days. And, but it was incredible. There were lots of the flora and fauna and just the scenery of Antarctica. Weather highly variable. 87 of us did finish the marathon. And we had to run it on the ship. And I'll give you some more information about 
that. So it's the only sanctioned marathon that's ever been run on a vessel. It's on still ship. famous in marathon, marathon yeah. circles. Now we had to run on the ship. I'll, I'll show you. Which was 422 laps around the <laughs> Which was not, it sounds easy, but it wasn't. Well, it's pretty flat. <laughs> well, not when the ship was underway. It was rolling. <laughs> I think about it. I'll show you more about it. And so this, the, the, the ship is a it's a Russian icebreaker that was converted to an excursion ship to do these kinds of things. So it was an all Russian crew, and uh, which that in and of itself was uh, interesting. I happened to me when they had a fish soup, there was a large, I guess it was a third grade, that I inhaled in that trachea. And this there was a Russian physician, a ship physician, take care of me. Not surprisingly, he was drunk. <laughs> I don't know what happened to that large fish bone that just I don't think he ever found. But anyway, yeah, one of those things that happens. He's still and that was <laughs> still He's trying to get a hold, of, get rid of another dentist. <laughs> so Mecca Genie met us actually. We met him, and we, we spent a couple of days in Buenos Aires, and we flew to Ushuaia, South and all those on the ship. And so they they are biologists and, and geologists. Others that they were do, doing research, and so we had a series of uh, lectures in the uh, in this kind of meeting room on the ship. And, and behind, can't see behind each of the chairs, like on an airplane, there was a, a seasickness bag. <laughs> <laughs> so during the lecture, you'd hear, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> God, and you're like, have any of you been seasick? Yes. I, I fortunately do not have motion sickness, I've had some of this. And we, as I said, we had several shore landings, and we would offload onto these uh, zodiacs and go on the shore and look at you know, lots of sun of penguins that last me for the rest of my life. Penguins and, and sea elephants and birds. And, you know, it was very interesting. And you can see uh, from this, this when we left the ship, we were there in February, so that's like it's their summer, the middle of their summer. And we were we began there, and then a blizzard, a snowstorm would come through, and then the sun would come out, the temperature would rise and fall. It was always right around freezing, would be about the high of the day. So this was the morning of the marathon, the blizzard. The day before this, the, uh, the marathon tour group went ashore on uh, King George Island. They laid out the marathon course, which we were looking forward to running with some trepidation, because it was a, a, a down a road that went between three research stations. Uh, I'm not sure one was Chilean, and one was Argentine, and one was Russian. What we're looking forward to most of all was we were the, the Russian, and they were going to have water stops for us, these different research stations. And the uh, Russians served vodka uh -huh. as a water stop. At least you felt no pain. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I don't know if you do it. And then we had, we had to do the route twice and, and uh, had to do several miles on a glacier as part of it. But anyway, the morning of the uh, marathon, <coughs> it was a blizzard. And some pretty high winds and snow, and they would not allow us to offload because it was in the zodiacs. You get on the water, and these zodiacs have a graph, the wind gets under the zodiac and flips it over, and everybody's in the water. That it's actually sub freezing water, it's below 32 degrees. And would not last. So they said, okay, the marathon is canceled. Well, we're there to do the marathon, so we all petitioned to do the marathon on the ship. That's how that happened. We started out running a corridor on a lower level. That was really difficult. And the ship was underway. They wanted to get to a, a, 
special place which I'll show you called Paradise Bay. So the ship, they had to be on the way to get to that Paradise Bay. And so the, it was a pretty rough sea, so the ship was rolling and pitching and turning. So you had to really be careful. Plus the, the decks were, it was about freezing, the decks were fairly, it could be very slippery. And you could slide and go underneath the rail. And then, so, so that it didn't happen to anyone. There were some other injuries. So it didn't work very well running on that lower deck. So I actually was the one I petitioned the uh, our race director who talked to the captain. Captain, they said that we could run on the upper deck, which was wider and open, and uh, that worked much much better. So we, we, we had to do it in four different groups. There wasn't enough room for all of us. So I was in the first group. And as I said, 422 laps. And it wasn't easy. There were hazards. There were fire extinguishers. There were extinguishers. There were, there were light boats and rails. And passageways. We had to run through these passageways and step over this. You can see that yeah. one fellow had hit this earlier knocked himself unconscious. One fellow broke his thumb and he had a fire extinguisher. So it, was, it wasn't easy. This is our, it was the first group that finished and as I said it was 422 laps. And you can't count yourself. We had to have people counting for us. This is Paradise Bay and it really is beautiful. It was a nice day. We were there. It was sunny and we spent a few hours there. And then they offered anyone who would like to go swimming. Oh. <laughs> I wish I had. It would have been 10 seconds in the water. I could say I went swimming in our in our. And then this fellow did. And you can see that he has a, a rope. They tie a rope around everyone because some jump into that water and some 32 some freezing water go into spasm and sink. Nobody sank, but that. And you can see he's out there floating around. Does he have a bathing suit on? <laughs> I, yeah, he had a bathing suit. That, that, that fellow was a petroleum engineer in Houston. So he was a, a character. Okay, our next uh, year was uh, Africa. And this was in uh, Kenya called the uh, Safari Kong Marathon. Have any of you been to Kenya, to that part of Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe? It's in the border from Tanzania. Okay. Which border again? Uh, Tanzania. Oh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, Kilimanjaro is right here. It's just in Tanzania. This was uh, interesting because the, the uh, the marathon was run in a game preserve. And it was a fundraiser for this game preserve. I think it's still going. We flew to Nairobi. We stayed there a couple of days and then we were bused up to this area, which is the equator. So it's just north of the equator and uh, very close to Mount Kenya, which we climbed after the marathon. Well, sort of. Did you get faster? Times of the lions chasing. <laughs> <laughs> times of the lions chasing. One hour. Uh, yeah, one hour. <laughs> yeah, there's a good good story about that. Not with me, but another. Now, mm -hmm. I don't forget. Yeah, we were out there running, and there was one fellow. And he was pretty slow. And he was very heavy, but he did a lot of these marathons. And I passed him. I said, "How you doing?" And he said. God, I hope a lion gets me so I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> he did finish a couple hours later, the lion did get yeah. in. But that was a possibility. Uh, being gored or trampled or eaten or something. Okay, so this is the Label Wildlife Preserve, and this is a, a private organization, and uh, I think it was European, but they bought a lot of land. Fenced it in. They obtained wildlife because all the wildlife were being killed off by primarily by the farmers because the lions and so forth they eat the, the cattle and take them out of livestock. And so they had guards to protect this to keep out the poachers. So it was a wildlife preserve. 
close to the equator. There are 440 runners there, and it is listed as one of the five most difficult marathons in the world. And the day that we ran this, typically, it was cold, it was 50 degrees at start, it was 90 degrees, we were about 90 by the time I finished. It was over 5,000 feet and a lot of hills, so it was, very, it was my slowest uh, uh, marathon. Incredible scenery, and there was danger, although not that I, not that I know of any of our group didn't experience any wildlife encounters. We lived in safari conditions, and we also did some uh, game viewing. So this was my slowest marathon, and it was really, really hard <laughs> towards about the last hour. It was a struggle to keep going. But I still won my age group by 45 minutes. I was slow, but the older ones were used, slower. And I beat several Kenyans. That was wow. <laughs> <laughs> they were old Kenyans. You need a gold medal. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so here we're at the uh, quarter, the, the Ramses and Laura and I. The sign into the preserve. So we had uh, safari type accommodations and a couple of interesting things about the accommodations was the, the back part of the way were the individual tents. They were uh, really pretty nice in the back part of the tent was actually the actual bathroom with a porcelain toilet. Yeah. Wow. A porcelain flush the toilet. <laughs> they dug a hole in the ground I guess. And uh, so for the bath, they always, uh, the workers had uh, these big tubs of water heated when they said you wanted a bath. And, and this bucket up the tree and then the hose going down to a shower head and they'd get up there and pour the hot water into the, uh, and the bucket would go down and come out the shower head. Scalding. Let's go. Yeah, quickie shower. Folks. We're kind of like a sun shower. <laughs> kind of like a sun shower. Serious. The water was a lot much hotter. The night before, they had a, a party for us, and some Buddhas uh, did a war dance. And some Buddhas apparently came from the north and uh, from, from the Somali area, of course, many, many centuries before that. And one group, the Sambudas, stopped in this area. An offshoot of the Sambudas were the Maasai warriors. So the original were Sambudas, and they traveled further to the south. They're more in the, uh, down in the Kilimanjaro area and the uh, Serengeti. And these dancers, they were drums going, they go into kind of a trance. And we left, I guess, but not a kind of point to put it I guess they danced all night. Hypnotic statement. They just keep moving. This is a, a Kenyan porta potty. It's made with uh, reeds and so forth. And they're out scattered on the course, and they and then they had signs up at some of the places to turn, and they have to go out very early in the morning because the elephants will trample these and they'll tear out the signs. And plus, they go out to get them off the course. And some of these they have to rebuild very, very early. And we just gave you the picture I took. I like this one in, in particular. Wow. How did you get the pose for you like that? Impressive. Wow. It's all lost. <laughs> Rhinos and water buffalo and ostriches. And I was running down one trail, right down the road, and ostriches were in right in front of me. <laughs> that was interesting. And so early in the morning, before the run, the uh, rangers went out and they cleared the root of all the potentially dangerous animals, and then they they did surveillance during the entire event. And so, let's see, up, up on this, oh, that's a ranger with a rifle. So sitting there where you can watch the, uh, as if you watch for any dangerous animals. Then a small plane. Floor of the course, all the entire day, it's uh, 
uh, spotting for any potentially dangerous animals. And Laura, Laura uh, ran and walked uh, a half marathon. And a warrior in one of the water stops. This is uh, typical of the surface we ran on. It was a very soft, fluffy dirt. And this is interesting because of the shoe, uh, all the shoe tracks. But just to show also, this is the nicest surface. My feet felt better, even though it was a long, hot, tough run on that uh, kind of a semi, semi soft surface. This is a canyon I did not beat. He went by me like a flash. <laughs> So here, here I am crossing the finish line, and, and they had the award ceremony 15 or 20 minutes later. And I was the only one in my age group, so I'm the only one that's on the podium. So I got the first prize. I'll take it. This was at a, a game viewing uh, park. It's actually two or three days before the marathon. We stayed overnight. It was an interesting place uh, called the Ark, and they had floodlights on a water bowl. And anytime during the night, you wish you could sit, it was all glass in, and you could watch the animals come down to the water bowl, which is, which is interesting. This started with dinner. The reason I showed this, and the sad story, this lady who was a, a speed walker, a very good speed walker, came in at a pretty good time, and she was really struggling getting to the finish line. I actually went out and helped her get across the finish line. We took her to the medical tent, and so they gave her fluids, and she was in there resting, and Laura and I went over there, oh, maybe a half an hour to finish, and she was sitting up, and she was feeling a lot better. And then they, this was her husband, and they left, uh, went back to, the, to, to our safari camp, and she laid down to take a nap and never woke up. Uh, she died. And they had no advice. We heard of it in Nairobi and they did an autopsy and they could not return. Well, she, was a, she was a very, very strong, physically fit, healthy person. So that was a, a downer. Very nice people. So uh, two days after that, then we, well, we had decided to climb Mount Kenya. Every, anybody can climb Kilimanjaro, that's easy. But not everybody does Mount Kenya. No, that's not true. It's, Kilimanjaro is not easy either. So we were uh, driven to this uh, resort. We got outfitted and we had hired a, a group of porters to take us up the uh, mountain. And it was a it was, uh, three days, well, but anyway, we went to one cabin, then we stayed there about 10,000 feet, and then we climbed to, uh, there was a, they call it a hut. In this area, this is 14,000 feet. And uh, Laura, and the, there are three peaks to uh, Mount Canyon. This, I forgot the name, this is the third peak. And that's, these are very technical and difficult climbs, as you can imagine. Yes. This is not, it's a scramble. Meaning, you don't need technical gear, you can use your hands and feet to climb. And we stayed overnight in order to summit the next day, but for the first time and the only time in my life, I got a cute mountain sickness. Really? And I, if, if, any, if any of you had that, you've been to go to high altitude and you haven't adjusted yet, nausea, weakness. My mom had it. <laughs> did, you, did you take the high mountain? No, I did not take Dymox. So that's what's my I, Yes, I, after this, when I, and I did, still did some climbing, I did Dymox. Dymox may have, but I, I, I've done a lot of mountain climbing, a lot of things at high altitude before this. So I've never had a problem. I think it was because I did the marathon in three days oh. uh, before that, and I had not recovered. But, but uh, the Ramses also, and then Laura, but then obviously they, 
weren't impacted the same as I. So they climbed, this is at the peak of uh, Kenya, and I just climbed back in it. So I tried, but I couldn't. I just couldn't. I could go on back and slept for a few hours, but I was, I was okay. We climbed down. Okay, our next was uh, South America, and I searched these out, and there were only two marathons I could find in South America. One didn't look very interesting near Santiago. But the second one was the Easter Island. Well, that looks interesting. Have any of you been to Easter Island? No. I've seen, I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. I'll show you this. You really have to want to go to Easter Island. <laughs> It's a long trip. It's a long way out there. And it is uh, about 20, about 2,000 miles off the, it's, it's uh, part of Chile, off the uh, coast of Chile. So we flew to Santiago and a day or two there and then out to Easter Island, or Rapa Nui in uh, Polynesia. And it is a unique place. And it was a hard run. And I'll show you, it was out in the back. So there is a town, 90% of the population is in this town. It's about 20 oh, miles, maybe not quite 20, 17 miles from the end. There's one road that crossed the island, goes out here to a beach. So we ran out to that beach and ran back. And why it would have been so difficult that there's a pump in the middle, so it's a 750-foot climb going this way, and then 750 down and then back up 750. So there's an elevation gain of 1,500 feet, which is a lot in a uh, marathon. So it was not an easy. It was a challenge. And there were rain squalls and rainbows, and you know how it is in the South Pacific. These rain squalls come through. The sun comes out and the rain goes. So yeah, pretty. From that standpoint, it was uh, it was pretty. Uh, Fifty-two runners, not an elite group at all, because I finished seventh overall. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> out of all forty-seven runners, that that was my time was actually a little better. Than that was four fifteen. The picture was taken. <coughs> So Sally, there's the tank top. You so did a good job. You did. <laughs> After I've lost that light of time, it just works. <laughs> so were you, were, you, oh, were you first in your age group? Oh, I'm, yeah. Oh, sure. I'm sure, <laughs> I was. I, I'm sure that I was. I, in fact, in the later years in the, in the marathons, I was the oldest runner out there. I'll show you one in particular. You know, if there were so few runners, you probably didn't see another runner for miles. No, yeah, I think I had another. Yeah, there were still miles. Uh, well, one of the factors, there would, there would be times that I was out on this road, and I could see quite a ways ahead of mine, and there was nobody else out there. I was all by myself. So I can't be lost. There's only one paved road on the islands. I was And th these are amazing, but once you see them, oh, I kind of see them. There's not a lot of really interesting things on Easter Island. So, like I said, you have to want to go there. Well, but they had, they had it doesn't interesting their spirit. To, you know, Penny pass out of the ground kind of thing. And then you have these lineups, too. Yeah. So. yeah. That, that was interesting, too. There was one place that the Moai were all a certain stone, that's where they're all carved, and I forgot what it's called, but there, we went out there, and that was interesting. You could see some had been partially finished. And never, I guess it's unclear as to exactly what, what that civilization, civilization was and what happened. So the start, this is close to the finish. You see all by myself. And they claimed to have the most beautiful sunsets in the world, and boy, they were, they were indeed spectacular. Okay, the last was uh, Asia. And there were a 
few, not a lot of marathons, and I searched them out, and there was actually one that I, I signed up for that was canceled. It was in the Himalayas, and it was going to be at about 14,000 feet. Huh. Well, that's oh. like a good challenge. And it was up in the Kashmir area, uh, and I don't have it on this map, and uh, there, there were some military uh, conflicts going in the area, so the marathon was canceled. So I looked for another, and I found this one. I thought, well, Siberia, that's an interesting place to go for a marathon. Who would think of running a marathon in Siberia? And have any of you been to Siberia? I always thought Siberia was further north. Well, it, it goes, it's Siberia. This is all Siberia. Everything uh, east of the Ural Mountains. West of the Ural Mountains is Europe. Everything east is uh, Asia, considered uh, Siberia. Really? And so where we did the marathon was in Omsk, which is at the quite far south, near, just north of Kazakhstan. And uh, it was a uh, uh, nice weather, it was fun. It was quite pleasant. We were there in August. There's Omsk. <coughs> now about three million. You probably never heard of Omsk. I never had a surprise when we got there. And it was a reasonably modern city with still some old, some Russian and Soviet remnants. And also surprisingly, there were 7,500 that ran the marathon. Almost all were Russian. There were some Europeans, 50 Europeans, only four Americans. Hmm. There's an interesting story about that too. Fairly flat course, some rolling, but it was a nice course. The crowds were good. There was good, good support, lots of water stops and snacks and things along the way. And they had some amazing pre and post race ceremonies the evening before. It was an event center, they had all these elaborate dancing and orchestras. And also after the US. After the night. So I had a pretty good time of four hours and, and ten minutes. And one of the most amazing things to me were there were so many pretty girls. <laughs> and the very interesting part of this is we took the Trans Siberian Railway from Moscow. If it, I guess none of you have been on the Trans Siberian Railway. Well, if you do, be forewarned. I didn't know that there were two levels of train service. There's the very upscale trains. Nice cars, good food service, uh, good bathrooms, and all of that. I didn't know, so I made reservation in this one. This is the very low scale, and it was it was pretty. And uh, this is the typical of the area the surrounding. And looking out the windows, the surrounding territory is very flat, pretty monotonous, not much scenery wise. So this is way north of. Lake Baikal, is that right? We weren't that far east, Lake Baikal. This is about, oh, okay. actually this was about a third of the way across Siberia and then we were on the train for three days. So that's a long distance from one side to the other. And uh, this is in Omsk and it's the, uh, this is the event center where they had that pre and post. It's a very nice, beautiful structure. And this is the young man who was a Russian expatriate. And he came to the United States with his family, I think he was 13, and he's now a dentist, and just north of New York City. Yeah. Very interesting guy, and he also had some more interest to our church. So this is during the run, one of their pictures, and I think that uh, I'm walking in this picture. I learned that very early, and marathons after depending on the route and the time and my state of fatigue but about mile 14 or 15 or 16 every mile maybe two miles i would walk for a minute which has very little effect overall on the time and it was a little bit of rest but it was just something to look forward to so 
Okay, when I get to the next mile marker, I can walk for a minute. Decide to get inspired, you want to train for a marathon. There are different ways of doing it. It can be a rigid schedule or a non-rigid rigid schedule. And I never had, was able to set up a schedule. I was very sporadic and how much I would run. Some marathons I would do long training runs. Others I did short runs that didn't make any difference. They all seemed to be about the same. I've always done a lot of cross training, bike, bicycling and hiking and uh, things at the gym. Carbo loading, I learned the importance of that. I don't do special supplements. Most of that's marketing. And it's, and, uh, but lots of water. Really have to load up with water because dehydration takes place pretty quick. Okay, the US marathons, the most exciting was Boston. I told you about that. It's, the most fun was New York. There was so much going on, such so many interesting things. One couple got, they were running and Wedding clothes, they got married in the middle of the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I saw them and they, they ran to the restaurant. And they, were the clothes. they were cut off. Most difficult was the first Boston, and I told you about that, I, was, I struggled. The easiest was Grandma's in Duluth. Most pleasant, Twin Cities, wonderful. My overall favorite is New York. So you did Chicago? Yeah, I did. That was my first marathon in Chicago. At least at Omaha. That was really boring. Like mm -hmm. Omaha. The most emotional was Yakima County. It was so exciting. Mm -hmm. And my boy. International marathons. Athens was certainly the most interesting. Most exciting was Atlanta. It was being the first marathon of the new. New millennium, the most unique, certainly Antarctica, running on the ship. The most difficult, certainly, was Kenya. Easiest, the Siberian of the international, and certainly the most long and remote is Easter Island, crowded, London. So, thank you for listening to my story. Traveling around the world? I've got 10 questions, but I won't ask them all because others need to. But what, what's the percentage of women, men, men, women typically in a marathon? Oh, it's about uh, two thirds, one third. Two thirds of men, about one third women. And that, oh, as far as I know, that hasn't really changed over the past 15 or 20 years. Have you ever hurt yourself during training that they had to cancel? So that's pretty good. Not really. I've, I've had I had cramps once I had to stop running. I was just about running. That's the only time I can remember having a cramp that I couldn't run. I not running. I used to last years. I the never one that I finished or was I really impaired by any muscular skeletal. I mean, my, my knees and hips are still okay. 